My name is M.O. Sabra. Uh, my when I was on the bench was a <clears throat> okay, welcome to this edition of the Legacy Project. Today, we have the pleasure of Justice Lodes Orton Sabra. Justice Sabra served in Division IV of the First District Court of Appeal in San Francisco from January 3, 1985 until his retirement on March the 4th, 1988. He is affectionately known by his family and friends as Mo. I am Carl Anderson, retired presiding justice of Division IV of the First District Court of Appeal. I had the pleasure of serving together with Justice Sabra in the same division on the Court of Appeal for three years, the best three years of my career. And before that, serving with Justice Sabra on the Alameda County Superior Court for 10 years. Justice Sabra was born <clears throat> 1926 in Saskatchewan, Canada, and came with his family to San Francisco at the age of 11. He graduated from the University of California in political science, graduated from Bold Hall School of Law. He started out the practice of law as a deputy district attorney in Sonoma County, and two years later, he migrated to Fremont in Southern Alameda County, where he practiced law for 13 years before being appointed by Governor Ronald Reagan to the Municipal Court for Fremont, Newark, and Union City. He served almost three years as a Municipal Court judge before being appointed to the Superior Court of Alameda County, where he served for 14 years. He has been retired from the Court of Appeal for 19 years and is now back in the saddle again. <laughs> Mo, how was it growing up in Saskatchewan? <clears throat> Well, that was a very uh, wonderful place for a young boy to grow up. Uh, we were out in uh, the country adjacent to a small town of 176 people. And uh, uh, we had uh, the freedom to romp and roll and uh, do all the things that uh, young boys are inclined to do. Uh, and uh, it was, a, as I look back on it, a very happy, healthy period of life. Uh, we didn't have a lot of wherewithal, but we certainly had our fair share of happiness, as I remember it. <clears throat> well, um, when you were 11 years old, uh, in 1937, at the <clears throat> depths of the Depression, uh, your family moved to San Francisco. Um, what prompted that? Well, you, you included that in your question. It was the depth of Depression. Uh, my father uh, was a farmer. Uh, but more than a farmer, he was uh, very mechanically inclined. He was a good carpenter, he was a craftsman, and uh, a farmer he was not much of. And uh, uh, in 1937, things were pretty tough. That was about in the middle of the Depression, and uh, we were having a great deal of difficulty making ends meet. And so uh, my father, my parents, decided that uh, it was time to uh, do something different, and uh, so we sold whatever we had, and uh, we bought a 1933 uh, Plymouth, as I recall, and uh, we uh, uh, set out for California. During those times, uh, can you just cross over the border uh, uh, at will? Well, <coughs> you couldn't uh, if you were following all the rules, but we sort of crossed over the border at will. Um, How'd you do that? Uh, well, <laughs> we had a friend <clears throat> who actually drove us to uh, Montana where we bought our first car. And uh, some of the plan was that we would drive to the, uh, to the American border at night and uh, just before the border, uh, my father, my mother, my brother who was nine and my little sister who was four at that time, got out of the car, went out into the field, and walked around the port of entry. Uh, the plan further was that uh, we would walk maybe a half a mile beyond the port of entry into the American side and uh, wait in the ditch there until the car came by, our friend, and he'd blink his lights three times and we'd come up out of the ditch and climb into his car and away we went. It went pretty well, uh, according to plan, except that uh, my father was carrying my sister 
<clears throat> in a blanket and um, we had to go through a barbed wire fence to get down into the ditch and uh, at that point uh, one of the barbs on the barbed wire caught on my little sister and she started to cry and that was a rather anxious uh, couple of minutes thereafter in hushing her up but nothing came from it and uh, so that's how we crossed the border. Why were you headed for San Francisco? Do you know why your folks wanted to go to San Francisco? Uh, my father had a brother who was working uh, in Wesley, California, which is out by Tracy. And uh, so this was somebody that we knew uh, in the area. And uh, that was, and he was suggesting that uh, there was work available. And uh, as I say, my father was a good carpenter. And, and uh, so he felt that uh, uh, this would be a place where we could get a new start. So did you start high school then in, in San Francisco? Uh, no, uh, I was 11 years old. I was in the sixth grade yeah. and so I went into the sixth grade. Uh, coming from uh, the wheat plains of uh, central Saskatchewan to San Francisco was quite a shock. <laughs> uh, but uh, I remember the first night that we were in town we were staying in some rooming house and uh, um, I uh, heard a noise outside and I ran over to my parents and woke them up because I didn't understand what was going on and it turns out it was a, a fire siren or a police siren. We never heard one of those before. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was our beginning of the introduction to San Francisco. Uh, we came, we became uh, very uh, well acquainted with San Francisco. I was selling papers on the corner and uh, uh, we were accustomed to running pretty freely and in those days you could do that in San Francisco. So we used to go down to Fisherman's Wharf and uh, and go fishing and we'd climb on the back of a streetcar and, and <laughs> ride to where we wanted to go and uh, we had uh, uh, an easy time becoming acclimated to life in San Francisco and uh, uh, for before very long, I was very proud to say, "Well, I'm from San Francisco." <laughs> How long did you stay in San Francisco? <clears throat> we were there for five years, and uh, that brought us to the uh, to December seventh, the beginning of uh, World War Two. <clears throat> and with that uh, event, uh, San Francisco was blacked out, uh, and uh, we were concerned at that point about the possibility of a further Japanese landing on the mainland and uh, my father uh, decided immediately that he should move his family out of San Francisco. So within three or four days we had moved to Santa Rosa and uh, uh, that's, <coughs> that's where we spent uh, the next several years. So did I you didn't complete high school then in, in Santa Rosa? I completed high school in Santa Rosa, yes, and that was a uh, 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 well, a wonderful experience. Uh, Santa Rosa was a little town of uh, 12,000 in those days and a lovely little place and um, uh, some of the uh, nicest memories uh, that I have are those years in high school in, in Santa Rosa. I met my, uh, my sweetheart there. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, eventually married after the war, but uh, that was the beginning of a romance. <coughs> so um, um, what happened uh, after you graduated from, from high school? Well, at, uh, that was in 1944, and of course that was while well, World War II was going on, very much so. And everybody who, all males who graduated at that time, were immediately subject to going into the military service. Uh, if you joined uh, Navy or Air Force or uh, whatever, uh, you went according to your selection. If you didn't, you were drafted. Uh, I was very interested in the Air Force and uh, did go down to enlist in the Air Force and was advised that because I was an alien that I would not be acceptable in the Air Force. And so I uh, I didn't, of course, and uh, thereafter I was promptly drafted. So you can you can't serve in, in in the Air Force because you're an alien, but you can be drafted into into the Army. Yeah, absolutely can, or at least you couldn't those days. That's okay. right. Yeah, no, that's right. Did you ever get you, you get this uh, 
uh, your citizenship uh, straightened out? Because I understood your, your mother was born in, in, in North Dakota, South Dakota? Yeah. She was born in North Dakota, yes. She was a citizen of the United States, and uh, we didn't know that at the time that we had this uh, nefarious entrance into the country. Uh, but she had never voted in, in Canada during the period of time that she was there. Actually, my mother came to Canada at uh, the age of five or thereabouts in a covered wagon from uh, North Dakota to a homestead in central Canada. And uh, uh, they brought uh, everything that they owned from North Dakota in, these, uh, in this wagon train, their cattle, their horses, their chickens, uh, everything, uh, to a homestead <coughs> in central Canada. So <clears throat> she had citizenship by reason of her birth in North Dakota, and she never lost it. And uh, uh, that was uh, her citizenship. But for me, <laughs> I was born in Canada. I was born uh, from an American citizen. I later learned that I didn't have to go through a procedure uh, that I did. but. <clears throat> In the military, uh, although I was acceptable to go into the infantry, uh, they learned that I was uh, and knew that I was not a citizen, and I was interested in becoming a citizen, and so uh, I was eligible to uh, receive citizenship, uh, providing I established my port of entry. Well, <laughs> that became a bit of a problem. How did you do that? <laughs> well, uh, I explained to them how, how I got into the country, and they said, well, we need a port of entry. So what we will do is give you a uh, three-day pass, and you go down to uh, Mexico and establish your port of entry and bring that back to us. And that's what I did. I hitchhiked down to Mexico. In those days, uh, if you had a, a service uniform on, all you had to do was stick your thumb out, and the first car that came by would pick you up. And um, But uh, I came back with my uh, port of entry uh, documentation and uh, probably— you, you just did that at the border then? And I, I went through the border, <coughs> came back, and then I had an entry into the United States that I mm -hmm. could show. And that's all that w was required of me. So that with that port of entry, I could— and being a, in the military, I could apply for citizenship, and, and it was promptly granted to me. So when you showed up at the port of entry, you were in uniform, and uh, you had no problem? No, no problem going into Mexico, no. I mean, coming out of Mexico. Oh, coming out of Mexico. Uh, I guess I had no problem. I don't recall uh, any detail there that was a problem. I was in the United States Army uniform, and I had an ID for the United States Army, so uh, I don't recall any problem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then you establish your, your port of entry, and then were you sworn in as a citizen? Uh, I was sworn in uh, at the Superior Court in, uh, um, let's see what county, whatever county that is. I was st stationed at Camp, Ro Camp Roberts at that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. San Luis Obispo, yeah, yeah, that's where it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you did your basic training at uh, Camp Roberts? and uh, uh, I took my basic training at Camp Roberts, yes. And this is infantry training? This was infantry training, yes, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the military. I enjoyed the infantry. I, I guess I was one of those uh, gung-ho people at, at that time, and, uh, <clears throat> and I, I was um, interested in becoming an officer, and so I applied for uh, officer's training school, took some tests, and um, oral and written, and uh, uh, I was held over after we completed our training, and uh, I didn't ship out with the rest of the company to Pacific or, or Germany, depending upon where you were assigned. And, <clears throat> and I um, anticipated that I was going to go to officer's training school. I'd also signed up for paratroop uh, training, and uh, I was anticipating they were holding me back because this is what I was going to do. Well, I did get my orders about three weeks later, and it was to report to a ship in San Francisco, a troop ship, and uh, uh, 25 or so days later, I ended up on the beach in Manila with a, with a shipload of, of uh, replacements. <clears throat> uh, was this a paratroop unit? 
No, this was a sh this was a shipload of uh, replacements <coughs> of all categories, uh, uh, and uh, at that point I had no paratroop training. I just had an ambition, and so. Well, what happened when you arrived in the Philippines? Then, well, uh, we camped on the beach uh, one night. And the Battle of Manila was still going on, uh, and uh, I got a call uh, the next morning to report to the headquarters tent, and uh, they told me to go back and get my uh, gear and climb in a jeep, and we took off, and I didn't know where I was going <laughs> at, that, at that point. Uh -huh. Turns out uh, I ended up at Lipa in the Philippines, which was about 60 miles away from Manila, and that was where the 11th Airborne was at that point. And, the, and I was promptly put into uh, paratroop training at that point. I and uh, some others that were in a similar category with me. So that was sort of an abbreviated uh, uh, air troop? It was a quick uh, hurry up yeah. paratroop training. Yes, yeah. it was, yeah. Uh -huh. About six weeks, though. Okay. Do you recall where you were when the, uh, when the atom, first atom bomb went off? Hiroshima? Uh, I think uh, my recollection is that we were on Okinawa at that point. And I know we were on Okinawa. And um, uh, we were actually, we had, had a couple of jump exercises there, anticipating that we were heading for Japan. <clears throat> and later, later learned from uh, operations material that that was the program. We had, plus a, uh, a large contingent, was uh, headed for southern Japan. <clears throat> so what happened after the uh, first atom bomb went off? Uh, well, the second atom uh, bomb went off, and at that point, we were with orders to go to Japan. And uh, we didn't know where we were headed. We just knew that we were going to Japan. We were loaded with all our gear. And um, we came to Atsugi Airdrome. And we anticipated that we were going to jump on Atsugi Airdrome. It's, it's, it's an airdrome uh, south of Yokohama, 50 or 60 miles, something like that. Uh, when we got there, the uh, commanding general, General Swing, uh, the circled the airdrome and uh, was suspicious that he didn't see any activity there, so he sent a plane down to land. And uh, the word came back that uh, there appeared to be nobody there at the airdrome that had been abandoned at that Just point. Just totally deserted? Totally deserted. There was coffee on the <coughs> tables, there was uh, papers, uh, uh, there was supplies, there was everything. Like somebody said, let's exit now, and that's what happened. And <coughs> Did you ever so, find out what happened to the Japanese that were manning this? Uh, this well, we learned subsequently that uh, they got out of there, they took their uniforms off, they threw them by, beside the road, or they ditched them, and, and they were civilians from that point forward. And uh, uh, we immediately sent some patrols out. I remember we went to uh, a, um, um, a nunnery, and uh, they were Germans, spoke only German, but they gave us our first milk that we had had in a long period of time. Uh, but we uh, subsequently observed, uh, 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 f well, five days later, MacArthur landed at the airdrome, and uh, we were there to receive him, and uh, he promptly got into uh, a sedan and headed for Yokohama, and the peace treaty was signed the next day in Yokohama. But we observed uh, the Japanese people at that point were... Um, uh, well, first of all, the only people we saw uh, as we went out on our patrols uh, was old men. And, uh, uh, and the old men were, I guess, uh, pleased to see that nobody was harming them, nobody paid any attention to them. Next thing we saw was little children. And uh, the GIs started giving the little children chocolate, chocolato. And, uh, the next thing we saw was old ladies out on the street. And then finally the, the young Cuebitos, the young Japanese girls were out on the street. It took about three weeks for all that to happen, but that was kind of the transition. So everybody sort of hiding in the hills? Uh, they were closed in, yeah. The, the, the windows were uh, shutters on, and they, nobody was coming out. Uh, uh, gradually, the, the, the progress of uh, going through uh, seeing who could get along out on the streets <laughs> took place. And, um, well, then did you stay in Japan uh, for any length of time after the war? Or? 
Uh, I was there for a year, yes. I was in occupation duty uh, for a year, went up to uh, northern Japan, and then from there the northernmost island of Hokkaido. And uh, uh, we, uh, I, I thought that, that General MacArthur did an excellent job in the occupation of Japan and the, and the orders that were given to the troops. And uh, the idea, uh, as far as he was concerned, is also the war is over and we're here to, re to rebuild, to assist uh, the country in getting back on their peaceful feet. And were the Japanese uh, population, were they, were they helpful or? Uh, they were, they were uh, I would say helpful, but more than helpful, they were uh, completely non-resistant. I mean, there was no attitude uh, or action that in any way represented uh, um, resistance. Uh, you didn't feel any animosity. No. Well, you you they were hard to they were hard to size up initially because they were so quiet and so um, conventionally non-responsive uh, in terms of anything that happened. They they just didn't want any trouble. And they didn't know what to expect. They had heard all sorts of stories about uh, uh, what type of people we were, and uh, I think they were. Uh, taken aback to find that that wasn't what they were experiencing. And uh, How was MacArthur uh, viewed by the uh, Japanese? I think they came to love him. Uh, uh, they come to respect him, first of all, because he's, he was a responsible leader. Uh, he was not taking advantage of, of uh, the victory that uh, could have been used by him or any military leader. He was more of a uh, uh, an administrator of the country in their eyes, it seems to me. And uh, I, I give him great uh, credit and wisdom for doing that. Uh, and of course, he had been in the Philippines. He was familiar with that part of the world. Uh, he understood the Japanese, I think, and uh, he, very effective. Okay, now you stayed one year in Japan then in occupation duty. Right. <clears throat> and then you were discharged in, in 1946, is that? 1946, that's correct. And yeah. what did you do when you were discharged? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> my intent at that point was to, uh, to come home and uh, go to school. I, uh, I had um, uh, observed from the military that uh, an education was very important. I liked the military. I uh, uh, was thinking about the possibility of staying in the military, as a matter of fact. When I came to uh, be uh, returned home, um, there was an opportunity for me to get a direct field commission at that point. And I, I was very fired up about it, but one of the things I wanted was an education. And I think if I could have got a field commission and guaranteed that I would get an education thereafter uh, and be satisfied that that was really going to happen, I'm, my whole career. Was so were you commissioned a second lieutenant or first lieutenant? I was not, no. no. I came back to the States, however, and did receive a commission in the reserve almost immediately. Uh -huh. uh, I, and you rose I, to major, didn't you? I did. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. In the reserve. Right. Yeah. Okay. So when you came, you wanted to go to college, you, you, you learned in the military that this was, uh, uh, you thought it was going to be important to you. Um, but nobody in your family had gone to college. Is That's that right? correct. That's correct. Nobody had. In fact, um, <coughs> I, I have to think about this. I don't think anybody in my family had completed high school. My mother uh, completed the eighth grade. My father completed the third grade. Uh, we, uh, my mother, it was very important to my mother. To my father, uh, as I say, he was very skilled with his hands and he could do uh, so much with his hands and he was very bright. And. Uh, but going to school was not his bag. <laughs> okay, so when you were just charged in, did you go back to uh, Santa Rosa? Were your parents still there? Uh, <coughs> my parents, in the meantime, during the war, my father, uh, um, in, in the meantime, had become a building contractor and uh, did a lot of work for the government during the war and had moved to San Rafael because much of his work was at Hamilton Field and other government uh, jobs in the area. <coughs> and so they had moved to San Rafael. I, I, uh, my uh, uh, 
high school sweetheart was in Santa Rosa. And uh, so I returned and lived with my folks in San Rafael for a year, but uh, got married the next year, 1947. Okay, what'd you do about your schooling? Oh, uh, I, I uh, <laughs> well, I had written to the University of California and um, allowed us how we had won the war and I wanted to go to school. <laughs> And uh, I received a nice uh, response letter and saying, well, we're very happy to have you. Um, uh, we would like to see a transcript of your high school grades. And uh, so after they saw the transcript, uh, they uh, allowed us how it might be necessary for me to go back and take French again and a couple of other things that I needed to take before I would be admitted to the university. So did you do that? I did do that, yeah. I went to... Uh, Santa Rosa uh, Junior College, and uh, I completed two years there in a year and a half and made all the made-ups that I had to do, and, um, and then went to the University of California at Berkeley. Okay, so you were married at this time to Betty? Yes. Yeah? Yes, I was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so then you went to Cal and you graduated in, in, in political science? And I did. Okay. I did, yeah. And, uh, and, and Betty's working and putting you through college, is that right? Uh, she was working at that you were time. Working too. Yeah, <laughs> she was working at that time. Up until our first son was born, she worked. Yeah. Okay. Then what? Uh, uh, what prompted you to go to law school? Because you went to law school right out of uh, graduated from Cal, didn't you? Right, I did. Yeah. I went right into law school. Well, I had no idea of going to law school when I uh, when I went to uh, Berkeley, uh, but I did get into uh, a, a memorable class taught by Jacobus. Uh, Tenbroke, and uh, this was a uh, public speaking class. And there I met Al Broussard and a number of other people uh, that uh, um, Joe Groden was was one of the students, uh, um, uh, but they were all headed for law school. And uh, Tenbroke was uh, was an inspiring instructor. He uh, He's a memorable one in my uh, memory as far as uh, an educator. He was blind, and uh, he was a lawyer, and, uh, uh, but he elected to teach public speaking, and he cranked in a whole lot of uh, philosophy with respect to public speaking. And uh, so I got, and then we, we went from one class to another, debating was another class, and uh, uh, everybody was going to law school. and so. Um, and the question was, well, what are you going to do? And I thought, well... Well, did Professor Tenbrook uh, encourage you to go to law school? Or? Not to me uh, yeah. personally, yeah. but that was the whole program, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, uh -huh. the Socratic method was used in his class, yeah. and... Uh, um, uh, but I didn't have a one-on-one -on -one contact with him where he encouraged me to go to law school, no. Well, he was a very popular professor. And oh, he was very much. I think much. there was a society that was uh, formed afterwards, wasn't there? And, that's uh, correct. Yes? Yes, that's correct. His former students? That's correct, yeah. yes, uh -huh. yeah. Um, so uh, I applied uh, t to go to Bolt, and um, I, uh, to my surprise, I was accepted, and uh, uh, I... Uh, decided that, well, I'll go there and I'll put in a year in, and if I get a year in law school, and uh, if I'm not able to go beyond that, at least I've got that on my record. And, uh, and what then, did your parents think about uh, your going off to school, uh, uh, not only graduating from Cal, but going on to law school? Well, they thought that was phenomenal, you know. They, that didn't they supported happen. you. That didn't happen in our family, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. no. And uh, so one year after another, uh, the, the years to tick by until the third year and graduation. And so um, at that point, I, w I was called back into the service. Oh. And I went back to... Uh, Is that the Korean War? Uh, the Korean War had just ended at that juncture. And uh, I went back to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia for an advanced officer's training course at that time. And when I completed... Uh, there was a an opportunity for me to make a decision on whether or not I wanted to make a military career of uh, my experience or whether I was going to go back and practice law. And uh, I concluded at that juncture that uh, I should go practice law. And 
So you're first. But I stayed on in the reserve thereafter, and uh, uh, and actually continued on in the reserve until I had uh, 16 years in of well, combined uh, active duty and reserve duty. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop and see my camera back up. Right. That was at Fort Benning. Fort Benning. Yeah. Was that at Fort Benning? Yes, it was at Fort Benning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what did you do when you came back, when you made your decision, you wanted to go to practice law and, and uh, came back from Fort Benning, what did you do then? Uh, I talked to a lot of people about a job. <laughs> and uh, I applied uh, in the uh, district attorney's office in Marin County, in uh, Ukiah, in Humboldt. Uh, I was really interested in going in the district attorney's office because I thought I would get some trial experience there. And um, uh, I was, uh, uh, Santa Rosa was my hometown, and so I probably had a little uh, inside uh, track there, I don't know. Anyway, I got a job in Santa Rosa, in okay. Sonoma County. So that was for the district attorney of Sonoma County? That was the district attorney of Sonoma County, Joe Maddox, yes. Okay. And then uh, <coughs> what, what kind of assignments did you have? What kind of assignments? Yeah, right. Exactly what I anticipated. Uh, I had a wonderful time there. I got to uh, try misdemeanors, uh, few felonies. Uh, uh, the office was a small office, and uh, they had the approach there that they would give you whatever you thought you could handle, and they felt you were able to handle. And so they give you the file and say the courtroom's upstairs? Yeah, and uh, yeah that sort of thing, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it was just wonderful experience. Uh, I just uh, couldn't have been more grateful than the opportunity I had there. But I knew uh, that I wanted to practice law. I, uh, I was most interested in the DA's office for the trial experience and the opportunity to act like a lawyer and feel like a lawyer. But I knew I wanted to practice law in, in a private practice. So you uh, stayed in the DA's office for two years, got your trial legs, and then what did you do then? Uh, I had an opportunity to go to uh, uh, Southern Alameda County. While uh, looking around for a job, I had made contacts in Southern Alameda County. And uh, somebody that uh, said they had a job for me, if I could wait a while, uh, came to see me in Santa Rosa. And, uh, uh, and they came to see me shortly after I was there, and I said, gee, I can't do this. I'm, I, I, I couldn't leave right now. But anyway, they came back again, and, and so we did get together, and, I, and so I came to Fremont. It was before there was a city of Fremont. I came to Centerville in those days, and uh, that was with Gene Rhodes and, um, and Judge Charisma, who was a Justice Court judge, great mentor of mine. Uh -huh. So uh, you went to work there and then moved to uh, Fremont, uh, never having lived there before? Uh, uh, well, actually, one of the things that they offered, which was the clincher, was that they were representing a subdivider in, in they, rep they did a lot of uh, uh, construction and subdivision work, and the subdivider that they represented was building homes in Newark, and they could provide a home for me. So you had the GI Bill, and so it was kind of... Uh, if I moved in, moved here, well, I could move into a new home, and it worked out very well. So how many children did you have at this time? At that time, I had uh, uh, three children. Mm -hmm. I had two children during law school, and, uh, and our little daughter was born in Santa Rosa. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, the fourth child was born in Newark. Okay. When you were... Practicing law. So you practiced law then for, what, about 13 years in, uh, I did. in Fremont? Yes, I did. You saw the city get incorporated? I did, yes. And were you active in the community at this point? Uh, well, um, I was. Um, my, uh, uh, my good friend, lifelong friend, Gene Rhodes, uh, suggested to me, now you're coming into a new community, and uh, I want you to remember that when you get in the elevator and uh, you get up to the ninth floor, the person that uh, you rode in the elevator with should know your name, uh, they should know you're a lawyer, and uh, they should also feel in their pocket and they'll have one of your business cards there. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he gave me such great advice. He said, get, become active in the community. 
And that was fun for me, and I did. I, I got involved in, in the Board of Education, uh, in uh, the Rotary Club, in uh, uh, the Salvation Army, in the uh, oh, Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, anyth anything and everything. And it was, it was a small community in those days. And, uh, it was easy to do, and it was fun. And uh, he was absolutely correct that uh, um, don't join an organization for the purpose of getting business. Join an organization to participate. The worst thing you can do is join an organization and not be active and, and, and not be involved. And I got myself too involved, maybe, but uh, it, uh, uh, it was great for the business long range. <laughs> I was, you know, uh, a short period of time, uh, uh, three years, I think it was, uh, or four years, no, maybe it was five years, uh, I formed my own office. And, uh, uh, and one of the uh, partners, you know, he was not a partner there, he was uh, a lawyer there, joined me and we were partners, Fred Abra. And then uh, within uh, a few years, the, the office grew and, uh, uh, I ended up representing the hospital and uh, uh, did a lot of construction work, uh, representing developers. I was extremely interested in real estate, taught real estate law for a short period of time uh, <clears throat> to people who were trying to get their real estate uh, broker's license or their license to, to uh, uh, sell real estate. And uh, the community was a special community. Uh, very what, what prompted you to uh, um, to become a judge? Uh, you were selected by Ronald Reagan in the first, uh, well, really this, the beginning of the second year of his first term as governor. Um, well, I I wanted to become a judge uh, from my early experience with the law. I thought that was the ultimate. Uh, uh, to have an opportunity to be a judge. I never thought it would come to me. Uh, and I certainly didn't expect it to come to me at the point that it did. And uh, I just felt that was a, an enriching way to spend my time. And uh, I had great admiration and respect for the bench that we had in Alameda County uh, in those days. Uh, there were the Cecil Mossbackers, who was, I looked to with uh, great appreciation. Uh, there was Don Quayle, and there were so many, Monroe Friedman. They were, they were real inspiring judges as far as I was concerned. And Most guys were on the Superior Court, but you were appointed first to the, uh, to the Muni Court in Fremont, Newark, uh, Union City. That's uh, correct. How many judges did you have uh, uh, at the courthouse then in, in, Fre in, Fremont? in Fremont? Oh, initially there was only one judge. And, <clears throat> and that was my former partner, Judge Charisma, who was a municipal court judge and later became the first municipal court judge. Thereafter, Roy Pucci uh, became the second uh, municipal court judge, but by that time, Judge Charisma had retired and joined our office. And, uh, 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 and I guess I was the third judge. Yeah. Uh, what was the question now? No, I, I wonder why. What? What? How did you? How did you become appointed then? How did you come to the attention of Governor Reagan? Well, um, I guess uh, when I put my name in, uh, um, I got some support from lawyers and judges, and uh, also I was active in the Republican Party, and I don't think that was an insignificant factor in those days. Um, uh, I, I was blessed with a lot of good responses. I think that's how I would interpret it. I we did have a we did have a celebration down here for uh, Ronald Reagan uh, at the time that he was running for governor, and um, we were, of course, in big support of him. And uh, uh, but that's the only time I had an opportunity to shake his hand. <laughs> Okay, so you you served uh, on the Muni Court for uh, three years, and then uh, uh, Ronald Reagan appointed you to the uh, Superior Court. Right. 
And I know that when you were appointed to Superior Court, uh, uh, your colleagues there uh, sort of uh, dubbed you uh, Mr. Fremont. <laughs> well, yeah, that would... Uh, you had quite a reputation. Uh, that would be a fair dubbing, I think, because I was uh, scattered all over the town. Uh, if I had to do over again, I think I would have spent more time at home and less time out doing the things I was doing. But uh, those, that's the benefit of hindsight. Yes. Well, I know that when you, uh, uh, you were on the uh, Superior Court for 14 years, and uh, during that time you, you were really a champion of Southern Alameda County. Uh, uh, historically, uh, Oakland had run, had run the county, and uh, um, maybe you could uh, enlighten us about uh, uh, what you did for the, the good of the southern part of the county. Well, we were very uh, concerned. I, I was active in, in the, uh, the local bar association uh, as well as the Southern Alameda County Bar, and we were very concerned about the fact that all the action was in Oakland and half of the county was down here, and we thought that that ought to be represented. We thought we ought to have uh, a uh, superior court, uh, and we eventually did get one in, in Hayward. And, uh, eventually got a courthouse in Hayward uh, where uh, a fair segment of the Superior Court was, was assigned, including yourself. Well, you were the first supervising judge of the, of the new Hayward uh, branch uh, of the uh, Superior Court of Alameda County. Uh, That's correct. That happened we, for a reason, I assume. Well, we were, we were keenly interested in, in seeing uh, a move south. and. Uh, as far as the court was concerned. And in fairness, um, uh, that was recognized and it wasn't uh, resisted uh, uh, beyond an initial question of whether or not that should be done. But, uh, um, and we got a nice big courthouse. But before the courthouse was built and opened, uh, uh, there was a sitting uh, uh, Superior Court judge in Hayward. It, That's it, correct, yeah. and more than one, uh -huh. in fact, you were there, you were number two, and Wiley Manuel, who subsequently ended up on the Supreme Court, uh, was number three. Is that right? That's my recollection. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. But there was always one judge there full time. That's correct. Yeah. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Okay. So then After it was initially established. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so you served 13 years on, on the, on the uh, Superior Court, and then uh, uh, were tapped by uh, Governor Duke Majin to. Uh, uh, to the Court of Appeal. Right. Um, how did that happen? Well, if, if you won't listen too much, I'll tell you how I, how I think it happened, how I pretty much know it happened. I think you had everything to do with that. Um, uh, I, uh, I was encouraged uh, uh, to make an application. I had one experience that uh, stimulated me in that respect. I was called uh, in 1979 about coming over to the Court of Appeal and sitting for uh, three months. And uh, that was uh, Rose Bird's uh, idea of bringing trial judges up to see what the Court of Appeal was all about. And it was received everywhere as an excellent idea. Well, very early on, uh, Shirley Wessner, my clerk, uh, said to me in the middle of a trial, Rose Bird is on the line. And I said, oh, sure, sure. The Chief Justice? <laughs> yeah, Chief Justice is on the line. And she says, no, I'm serious. And so, it's a true story. I got on the phone, and I don't know what prompted me to say this, but I said, are you sure you dialed the right number? <laughs> <laughs> and we both laughed. I think I was the first Republican that she had called in to do that, uh, and uh, we both laughed, uh, uh, but uh, that was a nice experience. I was over there for uh, three months, I think it was, and I was with Bob Kane and um, um, our dear friend across the bay who's no longer with us. Uh, uh, oh, God. Tom Huh? Tom Caldecott? No, it was Division Two. You were with. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was. Um, oh, Al Rouse. Al Rouse, yeah. of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. And um, uh, it was just a, a a wonderful experience. And I had an opportunity there to uh, 
write a decision that uh, the Supreme Court later adopted as their decision. And I remember being asked at the time uh, by the, uh, the committee that interviews you, you know, the th three or four member committee that interviews you, uh, uh, by the... Uh, um, the California Bar Association? Not the Bar Association, but uh, the Jenny Committee. Yeah. There's a four-member right. Jenny Committee, and, and they spent half the time asking me about that case, and, uh, and, uh, and they were impressed with the fact that that was very unusual. You must have some talent. <laughs> <laughs> what was the case about? I don't know. You know, don't ask me that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I honestly don't remember at this point. It's been a long while. But, I, but I, I, it was, it, I had that experience and also another case uh, the Cushman case, and which ended up in a um, in a um, jury instruction formed on the case, Caffers versus Cushman. And don't ask me what that was all about either, because I'll 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 fumble on that. So you spent three three months then in, in Division Two at the Court yeah. of Appeal on assignment. Yeah, and it was great. Yeah. I think I think it helped me uh, several years later uh, in terms of. Um, evaluating whether or not I was capable of being there. You thought I was, but other people didn't know. Well, Rose Bird was the chair of the, uh, the commission that uh, confirmed you, so... Uh, well, that's that true. Did, that, that helped <laughs> that a little bit. <laughs> that's true, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you, you, uh, you came to the Court of Appeal then on January the 3rd. You were confirmed uh, by the commission on right. January 3rd, 1985. Um, and uh, you came at the same time as uh, Bill Channel. I did. Uh, into Division Four, which had been really depleted. There was only one person in Division Four before uh, December, and that was uh, Mark, Justice Pochet. Yeah, Mark yeah. Pochet. Yeah, that's so, right. So uh, we had a full complement then in January. And then what did you do for the next three years? Oh, I enjoyed myself absolutely immensely, uh, both in terms of, uh, of the work uh, um, and, and most uh, equally uh, important, the companionship. Uh, we had a great team going there. and. Uh, I had known Bill Channel for a lot of years, but only ever so casually, and uh, I found him to be uh, such a, a gracious colleague and uh, special person. And of course, getting back together with you again was uh, like old times, and uh, uh, we just really had a wonderful time. We we had uh, collegiality like I'd never known before. And, well, and you I, were uh, didn't do many. Di you didn't. Uh, write many dissents while you were on the court in those three years, but uh, I do recall that there was a case I wasn't on that, that uh, you were writing a dissent and it's all the talk in the hallways is about this case and, and, and the, dis the, the uh, uh, friendly discussion between you and Bill Channel. Yeah. What was that case all about? Well, Bill uh, didn't see the light on that case exactly. Uh, he got mixed up with uh, Justice Pochet and they formed a little block there, and they were blindsided by each patting the other one on the back. And so I ended up uh, dissenting. And uh, that was a dissent that um, I had a great deal of, of uh, concern about. It involved uh, a couple of um, dogs uh, owned by a senior gentleman up in Ukiah who uh, uh, looked to those dogs as his helpmate, his companion, his friend. And uh, he went to town one day and came back and his dogs were missing. And he looked all over for those dogs. He eventually hired an airplane to fly around the area. He put an ad in the newspaper, he put an ad on the radio. Uh, he went to his neighbor, of course, immediately and said, have you seen my dogs? The neighbor said, no, don't know anything about them. He later discovered in a shallow ditch in front of his neighbor's house his two dogs buried in a shallow grave. And so he went to his neighbor and the neighbor said, yes, my hired man shot those dogs because they were over on my property and I had uh, cattle there. Were they disturbing your cattle? No, but they were on the property. 
Why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't. And um, there was a provision in the code, and it's still there, <laughs> to my dismay, that provides that stray dogs on uh, property where uh, cattle are maintained or other flock maintained can be shot. And uh, well, I, did, does the code define stray dog? Well, uh, not exactly. And uh, the interpretation that I had was that it needed to be a dog that was proceeding against cattle in a threatening manner or attacking cattle. It, it didn't seem right to me that some dog, unfamiliar with where the property line was, had wandered over onto the neighbor's property and he was subject to being shot at that point. And I thought that was outrageous. That was the law of the Pecos. It didn't belong in our society today, particularly where we have, we have uh, pets that are recognized as members of the family. And uh, so I had the dissent. And uh, uh, I just got it out of my system by dissenting. You became uh, famous for this dissent, as I recall. Being a well, you think it was the, the only decision I ever wrote, <laughs> because <laughs> I got letters from all over the place. Um, I uh, got more response uh, from that case than anything I ever did. And, and, and it was gratifying to me. Actually, I was asked by the San Diego Bar Association after I retired, a couple of years after I retired. What well, was at the time when uh, a lady across the, uh, the bay had a little dog pulled out of her uh, car and thrown on the freeway by uh, somebody in a, a road rage incident and attracted a lot of attention. And, uh, he ended up getting a year in prison for that. But at that time, there was a lot of uh, concern about uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the treatment of animals. And uh, the Bar Association down there was a, a concern to have my reaction about uh, uh, whether or not Dillon versus Leg could apply to this, <laughs> to this situation. <laughs> And, uh, Emotional distress. <laughs> that's right, and uh, and uh, I was of the opinion, of course, at that time, that uh, we haven't got there yet. But I wouldn't be surprised that it occurs in the future. And uh, but anyway, uh, I I had a nice visit with the bar association. They had a big assembly down there uh, on this subject, and um, so that case turned out to be uh, an interesting one and a dear one. But it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the Supreme Court didn't take it over. Uh, no, they. Yeah. Uh, although uh, it seems to me that Rose Bird said that it should, they should have. In fact, I'm pretty sure she did. That was a case where she. So said, she wanted to take the case. She wanted to take the case. Yeah. Based upon your dissent. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, we'll based on uh, uh, some appreciation of the incorrectness of Bill Channel and Mark Boche. <laughs> Okay. We had a lot of josh, joshing back and forth, and I, I used to uh, say to them afterwards, well, if Carl Anderson had been on this case, uh, the, the result would have been different. Anyway. Well, thank you. Um, Mo, you, uh, you, 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 do you have any thoughts about the administration of the court system in California? Uh, you've spent 20 years on the court as a judge, uh, uh, municipal court, uh, superior court, and court of appeal. Um, and. Uh, uh, where do you think we're headed? Well, you know, I, I hear pretty regular uh, reports on uh, the court today, and I observe and I read the literature. And, uh, um, I'm uh, frankly concerned about uh, the uh, fact that we have, uh, in the last 20 years, established a judicial Council that uh, has the responsibility for administering to the court as a whole. And it seems to me that uh, there's a good measure of inroad being made uh, with respect to the independence of the judiciary. 
Uh, I, I'm not totally facetious in suggesting that at the rate we're going, that one of these days we may have um, a ruling coming down from the council saying that when you uh, take a, um, an unlawful detainer action, these are the factors that you will consider, and this is what you need to shape your, this is how you need to shape your decision. I'm joking a little bit about it, but it seems to me that that's an eventual extension of, of the direction in which we're going. Um, local courts are told when they elect the presiding judge, how long the presiding judge is supposed to sit, uh, that the presiding judge will come to an indoctrination that's conducted by the Judicial Council, I believe. I don't know. I've never been a presiding judge, so I can't tell you that for sure. But that's what I understand happens. And uh, uh, I'm concerned about it. Uh, I, uh, I'm grateful to have been in what I consider the golden age of uh, uh, the judiciary, where there was a large measure of independence, uh, where individual judges had the, the responsibility of living up to their oath, but they had a great deal of independence on how they conducted their, uh, their courtroom and how they administered among their uh, uh, fellow judges, ladies and gentlemen of the court, and um, I, I see big inroads being made there, and I'm disappointed. Uh, and I, I don't know that I'm peculiar in this observation, because I still attend uh, judges' uh, conferences with some degree of regularity, and I hear this comment everywhere. I do. And uh, I'm not very popular, maybe, in being uh, <laughs> videotape uh, in expressing this because there's a there's a there's a measure of uh, timidness on the part of judges it seems to me to express their thoughts in that respect and uh, they're going against the tide when they do and what can be done to uh, to re to regain the independence I think a stronger judges association. I know the judges' association that we used to have is being gradually, uh, to my observation, being replaced and, uh, and uh, less effective, less united, uh, and uh, I think that's too bad. Well, you've, um, since you retired, uh, you've been very active in, uh, in mediation and in ADR work, uh, arbitration. Um, and uh, the Judges Association has, 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 has helped you uh, uh, with regard to that to some extent, have they not? The judges, the retired Judges Association right. has been quite active, yes. And I think they've done a good job of uh, monitoring uh, proposed legislation. They've done a, a good job of uh, uh, instructing within uh, the, uh, the membership of retired judges. And uh, I'm very pleased with what they're doing there. But I think that's different than, than, than the whole court working together. What do you think about the requirement now the state bar uh, uh, is requiring uh, uh, us retired judges to be active members of the state bar uh, in order to practice uh, uh, mediation, or arbitration? Uh, well, I don't want to overstate it, but I think that's outrageous. Uh, we are not uh, doing anything different as a private judge than we did as a judge sitting on the court. And there's no more reason for us to be considered practicing law in uh, doing the work of uh, a mediator any different than the work of a settlement conference judge. And uh, with respect to uh, requiring us to be members of the bar uh, because quote, we are practicing law in doing this, I think is, is unreasonable. Well, uh, Mo, you've had a very distinguished career, and uh, I know that uh, you were a great mentor uh, to, to young judges coming on the court and, and great mentor to, to young attorneys. Uh, did you learn that from, from uh, uh, other people on, on the court? Uh, uh, how, how did that come about? Well, I certainly learned it from other people on the court. Uh, I had um, uh, mentors. Uh, um, I think of Cecil Mossbacker and uh, Don Quayle and Monroe Friedman, uh, Alan Lindsay, uh, 
Elton Lindsay was more contemporary, but he was a grand judge, and he had a capacity uh, to, uh, uh, <laughs> the story goes, of sentencing somebody to state prison and, uh, uh, and having uh, the uh, defendant respond, thank you, Uncle Al. <laughs> uh, but he did. He much to learn about the capacity to not be full of yourself, uh, the capacity uh, to listen, the uh, capacity to not get troubled with uh, the concept of who is before you, whether they're a big firm, a small firm, uh, uh, whatever category they may be in, uh, the law is the same and the facts are the same. And uh, to be able to do that, uh, which I view many judges have the capacity to do, uh, is, um, I think, an inspiration to fellow colleagues, and it's an inspiration to the bar that practices before them. And uh, I'm grateful for what I've learned in watching them, in hearing them, and practicing before them. Well, Mo, you've been very active as a mediator in the last 20 years, or 15, 19 years. Um, how do you find time for your hobby of taking care of your horses and taking them on rides? Because you've done a lot of riding in, in, in your <laughs> judicial career, and I just wonder, where do you find that time? Well, uh, that's the blessing of, of, of private judging, because you do have more control of your time. Uh, um, I know for a long period of time I was uh, very pleased to be able to take uh, three to four months off. Uh, during the course of the work and, and uh, just chart it out in advance and you're not in the position of having to take anything or everything that comes through the swing door. And, uh, uh, and I don't know how much more blessed a person could be than retiring at the time that we are retiring now with every opportunity to continue to stay abreast with uh, what's going on in the law and an opportunity to continue to greet uh, uh, the lawyers that we've known for years and years and years, uh, the opportunity uh, to feel like we're not getting stale or we're doing something about not getting stale. Uh, this is an opportunity that didn't exist previously. And to say nothing about the fact that we have an opportunity to make uh, an income that's commensurate with uh, what I think judges should be paid. Uh, it's distressing to me. What was the question? Um, the well, we were talking about mentoring. Uh, it was going to judge, just judges pay. Oh. I was, saying, I was yeah. saying that it's distressing to me to see uh, judges pay where it is today. For example, we have young lawyers getting out of, uh, out of uh, law school and getting started at the same pay that uh, a judge receives uh, on his appointment, his or her appointment. Uh, I, I think that low pay is a reflection on the uh, attitude of administration, the legislature, whomever, uh, uh, of the value of judges. Now, fortunately, we have example after example of uh, uh, lawyers who are making multiples of what a judge makes and are willing to give that up to become a member of the judiciary, and that's to their great credit. But I don't think it's to our credit as a, as a community, as a state, uh, as a country, to be paying judges in, uh, in a manner that uh, we are paying them just because we can continue to get them. I, I think it's wrong. Yes. What advice would you have uh, um, for new judges coming on the bench? Well, uh, I would say that one of the, one of the initial uh, important qualities uh, to uh, seek to emulate is to not be full of yourself. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, temptation as a practicing attorney to see uh, the power and the uh, authority of a judge and 
remember that's the position and uh, not the individual uh, that we pay so much homage to. But it's, it's, it's a daily task uh, to, to remember that. Uh, I think that's important. I think that's extremely important because uh, there's one way that a new judge can um, uh, impact their image uh, unfairly to them uh, is by uh, looking too pompous or appearing too important in your own image. Uh, uh, secondly, I think that it is extremely important to listen. And when you're done listen, listen a little bit more. Uh, uh, you, can, you can do so much to uh, enhance the image of uh, the decision maker if you are patient enough to listen. And it is, uh, it's not an easy uh, assignment because so often uh, the judge has got a crowded calendar, he's got people waiting in line to be heard, and uh, he has the responsibility of finishing up before the end of the day comes. And uh, so it's not an easy task, but there's a perception of being uh, a good listener that, uh, uh, that can be projected by a judge, and I think that's terribly important. It's good advice for a mediator as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't, any decision maker uh, that uh, doesn't do that, I think, is building in problems. Well, Mo, you've uh, thrown yourself into the judiciary 150% uh, uh, at every level, the, the municipal court, the superior court, and the court of appeal, and, and now you're doing the same thing in retirement. Uh, uh, you're still involved in the community, um, and you make a difference, and we thank you for that. Thank you.